A Story of Tigers from Jillian Wolf. Jillian, to the stage, please. Okay, so we're pretty much just gonna stick to the sex and the violence because we only have 10 minutes. So, Mabel Stark was born Mary Haney uh, in Kentucky, but also maybe Tennessee because everything I learned about her was contradicted by the very next thing I read about her up to her autobiography, which was full of lies. So, <laughs> she was a circus performer. It was a thing of the time to make everything fantastic. So, we're just gonna kind of ignore the dates. And um, she was also an only child or one of seven. And then she was orphaned by uh, the age of 11 or 13 or 17. But she went into nursing really quickly, like five minutes. And then the next thing we know, she's a hoochie coochie dancer in the circus. <laughs> and from what I understand, that's basically like belly dancing. I'm not totally sure. I think that's probably a different talk. But um, <laughs> then she met Algie Barnes, which was kind of her end of the circus. And he was taking care of the menagerie. And so she was always obsessed with the big cats. Like that was her whole goal. And the tigers are known to be the most dangerous of all the cats. So. She uh, was hanging out there, and Algie Barnes decided to split that circus and start his own circus and took her with him and trained her. And so she was new in the Algie Barnes circus. And so at the beginning, he put her on a horse. And um, oh, this is, this is Algie Barnes. And <laughs> do we really? That's so great. We've had so many horses. OK. Um, so. At first, he puts her on a horse, and she fucking hates that shit. That shit is stupid and beneath her. And since I don't have pictures of what that exactly looks like, I had to make, I had to take some liberties with the undocumented version of this story. I can only imagine it looked a lot like this, okay? So she hated that shit. She really just wanted this. And she wouldn't really, well, actually, it probably looked more like this. Um, so anyway, at this point, she already has a failed marriage and we're just gonna dive right into the husbands because there were just so many and we have to get through them. So I don't know who the first one was. He wasn't even given a name, it just failed. I don't know. Um, and then next, uh, she found Lewis Roth who was a tiger trainer in the Algae Barn Circus. He was the first to ever use positive reinforcement and rewards as a method of training tigers instead of just beating the shit out of them. So novel concept. So since, you know, he was a tiger guy, it kind of made sense that they were going to get married. So they got married, but unfortunately he was also on a reward program for himself of shitloads of alcohol. So um, <laughs> that only lasted two years. And also she didn't really need him because she was already such a burgeoning act of on her own, three years later after that divorce, she was the number one act in all the Ringling Brothers circus. So next up, she starts dating the accountant of the Ringling Brothers circus. <laughs> kind of an unlikely match, but I'll explain later. Next thing we know, it turns out he's embezzling money <laughs> from the Ringling Brothers. And so, he gets fired and then she divorces him because she's like, oh my God, I don't want anything to do with this. And the Ringling Brothers, uh, she feels like they ended up punishing her because the next year they cut all cat acts. So this is 1925. And she feels like, I know, I think they're just punishing me. But she's still under contract. So she has to just do horse acts, which we know how she feels about that. Now, next up in the husband's, she hangs out at the menagerie again because she just likes the menagerie guys and that's where all her cats are. And she meets um, Art Rooney. Now, Art Rooney, she ends up marrying and they find that a little bit of a surprising match because Art Rooney loves to wear makeup and nail polish. Um, but in the end, she really digs that and this is the only marriage that was for love. And she says all of her other marriages were just for utility. So. Back, there was one more. He died really soon after that, and it wasn't recorded why. Soon after that, she meets another menagerie guy, uh, Ed Trees, and nothing is really said about him. So let's get into the violence. So, so 
she, I'm just going to start reading quotes. I just want to give a warning, the next few slides are not for the faint of heart. So I'm going to, this is a quote about her most severe mauling, which ended up leaving her with uh, 378 stitches. Um, and she was in and out of the hospitals for two years after this with muscle repair surgeries. Um, so that was like the height. But she also says, there, oh, let's just get into the action, shall we? Okay. <laughs> there is no part of my body that doesn't bear the scars of tiger teeth and claws. I have been clawed 75 or 80 times. Six times I was given up for dead and told I'd never train again. And then here comes the most badass quote of the whole, this is just what I should have titled the whole thing. A tiger can whip anything but a gun and me. <laughs> don't know women like this, and they have to still be out there, and we have to find them. But, uh, so, this is getting through, through the violence. This is one more of her quotes of the actual, the, the big mauling of the two tigers. The two tigers were called Sheik and Zoo. So, Sheik was right behind me and caught me in the left leg, in the left thigh, tearing a two-inch gash that cut through to the bone and almost severed my left leg just above the knee. I could feel blood pouring into both my boots, but I was determined to go through with the, with the, sh with the act. Zoo jumped from his pedestal and seized my right leg, jerking me to the ground. As I fell, Sheik struck out with one paw, catching the side of my head, almost scalping me. Zoo gave a deep growl and bit my leg again. He gave it a shake and plenty, and planting both bare forefeet of his claws deep in my flesh, started to chew. I wondered into how many pieces I would be torn. Most of all, I was concerned for the audience. I knew it would be a horrible sight if my body was torn apart before their eyes, and all my tigers would be branded as murderers and sentenced to spend the rest of their lives in narrow cages instead of being allowed the freedom of the big arena and the pleasure of working. I think it's probably more <laughs> pleasurable for her, but the thought, that thought gave me strength to fight. So in all of her 75 to 80 maulings, she never ever once blamed the tigers. In that case of that mauling, they had come in in the rain, the whole, the whole circus, and the, they had to skip the feeding. And normally you don't do a tiger act if you skip the feeding, but she was like, nah, I got this, we're gonna do this anyway. And um, in another mauling, she like slipped and they just kind of went after her. Um, I don't know, she has like, just, I just wish I had a picture of her scars, but I don't. Um, so, and then the, one another mauling was uh, she was attacked by a bunch of cheetahs during a parade. So of the 80 maulings that she went through, probably 70 of them were in front of audiences. And um, I was a little bit over the reenactments at this point, so you don't have a reenactment of a cheetah mauling at a parade. But um, <laughs> what happened was she had taken in a... Um, not at the mauling, but at this point, she took in a cub uh, named Raja, and she bottle fed it and, and raised it from kittenhood. And um, it was in her apartment, and you know she basically got to do more with that cat than any of the other ones that she trained. And so because she was so famous for surviving all of these maulings, people would buy tickets just to see if tonight was the night she actually died, you know? I mean, it was like, obviously, as you've seen tonight, entertainment met death-defying things. Like, that's just what people watched. And none of these tigers were ever killed for those attacks, by the way. Now, they shoot a dog if it farts too loudly, you know, like, but back in the day, like, well, not, not, anyway. So she has this kitten, and she raises it up, and she can do more with it than any other tiger. So she develops this act where she wrestles it, and she'll, like, throw it down, and then it'll attack her, and they roll around and then she puts her head in its jaws and then she stands up. And it turns out she admits way later that she, um, I don't know how to say this, but <laughs> she was sexually arousing the tiger on purpose. And so to the untrained eye, tiger flirting uh, is <laughs> violent business. And so, I can't make this shit up, people. Like, uh, so she was 
getting the tiger off in front of all of her audiences. <laughs> And it looked like she was getting mauled, and it was just like this perfect ruse. But she had to start wearing all white outfits to hide the tiger semen. Okay, this is... So she was actually known for her all white outfits, and it was her famous signature mark, the mark of marvelous Mabel Stark. It looked more like that. And... This is kind of what it looked like. And everybody was just thrilled with it. At the peak of her career, she had 18 tigers in the cages with her, and one of those maulings was during that, too. Um, so at one point, she, um, she was, in, she was like a, a stunt double for Mae West in her movie, um, I Ain't No Angel. And she got started getting holiday or um, Hollywood things, and she moved to Thousand Oaks. And she worked for a, uh, like a, a big circus animal. Jungle yes, Jungle Land, which is a crazy fucking place. Um, and all these crazy things happened. But she worked there for like 30 years. So she, like, I think she was 78, 79, since we don't know her age. She was 78 or 79 when she died. So she worked there forever. And she was training all these tigers. People would come, and it was just like a zoo amusement park situation. Now, real quick, weird segue. This is Jane Mansfield. And she was a very sexy, very busty B actress. She took her six-year-old son to Jungle Land for his birthday. He was mauled by a lion named Leo, possibly the lion that roars at the beginning of the MGM movies, who lived there. He had to get two emergency back-to-back -back surgeries and somehow managed to survive um, a fractured skull and a punctured spleen that they had to take out. And just like, I know this is a segue, but it's super weird and random. And then he survived that, and then six months later also survived the fatal crash that she died in where she was decapitated in a car wreck in New Orleans. And I don't know why we're not all talking about this, but anyway. <laughs> Oh, she also credits her son's survival with the ritual that Anton LaVey of the Saint of Church did. So there's just like Jungle Land is a whole different, you have to go down that rabbit hole. Anyway, here's Mabel into her 70s now, just an old lady with some cats, you know, they all end up the same way. Well, the problem is that in 1968, the, the ownership of Jungle Land changed once again and the new owner didn't like Mabel Stark at all, and fired her. And she was really, really depressed about that. And then really soon after that, uh, a tiger got out of Jungle Land and they shot and killed it. And she called them up and said, if you had just called me, I could have gotten that tiger back and you wouldn't have had to kill anything. And um, so on April 20th of 1968, she took a bunch of pills and killed herself. And um, I know that's a really sad note, but she's still an incredible woman who lived at the age of 79 and had 80 maulings, 18 tigers, the biggest act in the Ringling Brothers Circus. So I would like to raise a glass to Mabel Stark, who seemingly had more lives than even the cats she loved and lived for. May her tenacity inspire us all. Cheers. <laughs>